And thank you, Erot. Good morning, City Light. Good to see you, 11 o'clockers. My name's Doug. I love following Jesus with all of you. I'm going to start with a story this morning, but first, I need you to promise that you won't make fun of me for it, okay? So go ahead, maybe pinky promise with the person next to you. I will not make fun of Doug for this. Thank you. None of you did that. I love you too. Uh, Anyway, it wasn't that long ago. uh, Here's the story. When I, I looked at my life and my body and I was like, I need to get back in shape. Like, I need to rebuild some strength. I just need to get back in shape. You know those seasons or those moments in life where you, like, have these bursts of inspiration and these grand visions of yourself, and you're, like, at awesome health and tip-top shape? I was having one of those moments. Like, I was picturing myself climbing a mountain and running a marathon, you know, that sort of thing. And so, in my enthusiasm, I just said, let's get started. I dropped down on the ground and started doing push-ups right away. Around push-up number three, my shoulders just got so tight. Ow. Like push-up number five was really painful. And push-up number seven, I just like literally collapsed on the floor. It was so bad. My whole neck was in knots. I could barely turn my neck without tremendous pain. I couldn't bend my back. I mean, like my grand vision of being in tip-top shape ended at push-up number seven flat on the floor. It was great. My back was out of whack. Uh, thankfully, uh, my wife uh, reached out to a chiropractor friend of ours, and he said he could help me out a little bit and take care of me. And so we went and spent some time with him, and he graciously did take care of me. And what I learned is that what I thought was like an acute, sudden, surprising injury was actually in the works for a really long time leading up to that. And push-up number seven was just the straw that broke the camel's back, you know. Um, And I also learned that the process of recovery wasn't going to be here. Take a magical pill and everything will be fine. No, the process of recovery meant regular trips back to see my friend, the chiropractor. It meant regular realignment of my spine, regular readjustments, regular snap, crackle, and pops. You know, like it meant a regular rhythm of realignment in my life. That was my journey of recovery. I'm actually still in it to this day. And I think often when it comes to Jesus, like when it comes to our understanding of Jesus, our thoughts and imaginations of Jesus, like my back, sometimes we get out of alignment. We develop these misconceptions about Jesus. Like we might start to think that Jesus is domesticated. Like he's a nice little tame pet that we just got to feed and water and everything will go smoothly. Or we might start to think of Jesus as dull and dumb, disconnected from the real world and walking around in a robe and some like history book pages, you know. Or we might start to see Jesus as Mr. Rules. He makes the rules and he keeps the rules and he enforces the rules and and he's making sure you all sit up straight and mind your manners. Like we develop these misconceptions about Jesus. We all do it. And so we also all need a rhythm of regular realignment back to Jesus. And in this case, alignment means going back to the Bible Jesus. You know, like the real raw Jesus who is revealed to us in the pages of the Bible. These biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I don't know about you. Like, I know the Bible's been around for going on 2,000 years now. And I've read the Bible a few times. But every time I return to a Bible bi- biography of Jesus, I find him startling all over again. I find him surprising all over again. He's wonderfully refreshing. The Bible biographies of Jesus realign us back to Jesus, the most amazing person who has ever lived. The one who displayed the most incredible power we have ever seen and had the most pure passion all the way through his death and resurrection. And so this morning we're starting a regular rhythm of realignment back to Jesus by going through the gospel of Mark. And you got to know, Mark is fast-paced, okay? Like, he shoots straight, he hits hard, he does not try to beat around the bush, he does not hem and haw, he's just going to shoot straight. This is Jesus, this is what Jesus does, this is why Jesus matters. Snap, crackle, pop, regular realignment back to Jesus. So, if you've got your Bibles, please open them, or your Bible app, and let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We'll start there. 
short verse, and we're going to dig deep into it. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark starts at the beginning of the gospel. And that word gospel simply means good news, like declared, defined, good news. And Mark is going to give us in this verse and the rest of the chapter like three bits of good news, three chunks of good news, and that is the good news of Jesus' person, the good news of Jesus' power, and the good news of Jesus' personal path to the cross. It's more peas than can fit in a Jolly Green Giant can, okay? Got your peas this morning. First, the good news of Jesus' person, okay? Look back again at chapter 1, verse 1, and let's just acknowledge the obvious here, right? The beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Just stop right there, okay? Stop right now. Mark starts his gospel. He says, the beginning of this gospel, what I want you to see is Jesus Christ, person, real human, real man, the real human being, Jesus Christ. You know, whether we like Jesus or hate Jesus, whether we want to scold Jesus or worship Jesus, we simply cannot dismiss Jesus. He was real. Jesus really lived. Like he lived and breathed and he taught and he did stuff. Jesus is not a myth that was made up. Jesus is not like a system of religion and rules and regulations. Jesus is not a friendly character and a story that was crafted to help keep kids in line because he can see you whether you're naughty or nice and they'll reward you with presents under a perennial green woody plant every year. Parents, I'll let you do the translation there. You know, that's not Jesus. Jesus is not your favorite character in a best-selling series of novels. And Jesus is not a composite figure of various messianic lunatics back from a unique period of time. Jesus was, Jesus is a real person. The novelist H.G. Wells said it this way, I am an historian. I am not a believer. I just love how he comes out. He's like, just so you know, I don't follow Jesus. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. Well said, H.G. Wells. Jesus was, is a real person that we simply cannot ignore. Albert Einstein, who also was not a believer, he took it a step further when he said, I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful they are. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Amen, Einstein. He knew more than math. Einstein right here, he basically just said, you can't make this stuff up. There's just too much person, too much personality. Jesus' personality pulsates in every word. And as we track through the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see a very vibrant personality to this Jesus Christ. Jesus feels pity. He gets angry. He tells stories. At one moment, he falls asleep in a boat in the middle of a storm. The next moment, he's walking on water in the middle of a storm. Jesus asks questions, and he answers questions. He breaks the man-made traditions of the people in that time. At times, Jesus avoids crowds and pulls away like an introvert. Other times, he engages crowds and draws near to them like an extrovert. Jesus speaks tenderly to this older woman and this little girl, and then he speaks sternly to a guy that he just healed. And he speaks sarcastically, like Jesus had the gift of sarcasm. And he spoke that way to the religious, legalistic rulers of the day. Jesus was real and his personality pulsates in every word of the Gospel of Mark. And therefore, we have to respond to the person of Jesus. Just like the characters in this gospel also have to respond to the person of Jesus. Some of those people laughed at Jesus. Others were amazed by him, astonished by him. Some of them thought he lost his mind. Others accused him. Others even thought that he was possessed by demons. And still others, they chose to follow him. They followed Jesus the person. In fact, in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus calls his first disciples... Jesus said to them, follow me. 
He didn't call them to follow a system of like laws and rules and regulations. He didn't call them to like read really long books about deep philosophies. No, Jesus said, follow me. His call was to himself, to his person. Mark wants us to know right at the beginning of the gospel that it is good news about Jesus' person. So City Light, as we track through Mark and we regularly realign our hearts back to the Bible, Jesus, let's settle for nothing less than Jesus himself. Let's go all in and say, Jesus, we want you. Don't don't settle for like an Instagram or social media experience of Jesus. Let me explain what I mean by that. I don't know your social media habits, but for me, I'll pull up Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is, and I like start scrolling, and then I see this like amazing video of a one in a million trick shot. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's incredible. I've never seen anything. Okay, and then I just keep scrolling, right? And then my wife like sends me this awesome video about a whale like bumping a person in a kayak along, and I'm like, oh, that is so crazy. I've never seen anything. Okay, and then I just keep scrolling, you know? And it's like every time my ability to be amazed is a little more dulled. Every time I'm a little more lulled to sleep. And then sometimes I'll let that carry over to Jesus. And then at the end of Mark chapter 1, whenever I read about Jesus cleansing, Jesus healing a leper, I don't like pause and ponder the person of Jesus in that story. I don't go, oh, oh my goodness, wait, Jesus is going near a leper? Oh wait, Jesus is letting that leper come close to him? Jesus wants the mess? Jesus wants the dirt? Um, Jesus gives him healing instead of the leper giving Jesus leprosy? Oh, what marvel! How majestic, how amazing is the person of Jesus? I don't do that. Instead, I just go, well, that's another miracle. Keep scrolling. And I miss the person of Jesus. City Light, as we track through the Gospel of Mark, let's be followers of Jesus who pause and ponder the person of Jesus. Let's demand, let's crave, let's pursue Jesus. He is the good news. And so as you read through Mark, you might want to pray something like this. Jesus, I want you. Show me more of Jesus. You surprise me, frustrate me, win me, but whatever you do, draw me to you. It's the good news of Jesus' person. Mark continues, and he gives us another chunk, another bit of good news, and that is the good news of Jesus' power. The good news of Jesus' power. Go back to chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to go a few words further. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now most of us, we're going to read that like modern day Americans who lived some 1,500 years after the fall of Rome. We're going to read and go, oh, Jesus is the Son of God. That pretty much means that he's God. Yes, that is true. But to the original readers, you got to understand, the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome to a bunch of people in the Roman Empire, spread out all over the Roman Empire. And these were people who were already following Jesus or making a decision if they wanted to follow Jesus while they were living in the Roman Empire. And so in that Roman Empire, whatever town, city, village you lived in, there were these statues of Caesar on which were the words, Caesar, the Son of God. Or whenever you'd go to the market and buy, sell, and trade, you would use coins that had an image of Caesar and the words, Caesar, the son of God. These people were immersed in a culture and in understanding the idea that Caesar was the son of God. Caesar was all-powerful. Caesar held the scepter. He had the power. Caesar could charge you more taxes or Caesar could throw you to the lions. Caesar was the son of God. And into that culture, Mark dares to open his gospel with the line, the beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Who has all the power? Not Caesar, Jesus Christ. Who's the real son of God? Not Caesar, Jesus Christ. I told you, Mark shoots straight. He doesn't pull any punches. Like he starts his gospel by picking a fight with the most powerful empire in human history to that date. He's saying, oh, you think Caesar and Rome, you think they have all the power? That's kind of funny because you haven't met Jesus Christ, the son of God yet. You know what I mean? It's like that's power right there. That's how Mark starts his gospel, and that is good news because the power of Rome was used to bully people and beat them into submission. 
The power of Rome was used to like prop up insecure rulers who couldn't even get along with each other. The power of Rome was used to tax and make money off of poor people in distant lands. But if Mark is right, if Mark is right, and it's true that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ has all the power, then what kind of power can we expect from Jesus? I think just in chapter 1, we get like three aspects, three kinds of power that Jesus has. I just want to track through them, click through them real fast. The third, first thing we see in chapter 1 is Jesus has the power to teach with authority. The power to teach with authority. In chapter 1, Jesus goes to the synagogue and he does some teaching. And then we get verse 22. The people, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, power. And not as the scribes. This tells us at least that Jesus' teaching, it makes a difference in our lives. Like when we listen to Jesus, when we learn from Jesus, it actually works in our lives. Like some interesting statistics here. You and I, on average, we speak or hear or read tens of thousands of words every single day. We see over 4,000 advertisements every single day. We are bombarded with messages, teachings, words, buy this, do that, listen to me, listen to me, show me your eyes, give me your ears, all day long. And now here we learn that Jesus' words, Jesus' message, Jesus' teaching has authority. It has power. In other words, Jesus is worth listening to. His words can make a difference in your life. Jesus has the power to teach with authority. Secondly, in chapter 1, we see that Jesus has the power to cast out demons. So I told you in chapter 1, Jesus goes to the synagogue. He does some teaching. Well, coincidentally, that same day, a man who had some demons also went to the synagogue. Those demons started talking to Jesus, which, if you're a demon, it's not the best idea in the world to go talk to Jesus, just so you know. But these demons were doing it. They were kind of picking a fight with Jesus. And so Jesus responds in verse 25. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. It's like, you're done, demons. Get out of here. And the demons had to obey Jesus. Jesus has power over demons. Now, this is a part of Jesus, an aspect of his life and his biographies, that I think most of modern society would kind of rather just edit out demons? I mean, really, isn't that like ancient stuff, and now we've got psychology to explain all those things? Well, no, not really. Like, psychology can help, and it can be a good tool in our hands, but demons are still real. And I, some of you know it. Like, some of you are bothered by demons, and you hear their lies whispering into your soul, and you Spend a lot of life trapped and in bondage and in addiction. You know that demons are still real and they didn't just like disappear 2,000 years ago. And the good news is that those demons too have to submit to the power of Jesus Christ. He and his name still carry power and authority over those demons. The good news of Jesus' power over demons is so liberating and helpful and free for your past. And it's good news for your future as you want to imagine a hopeful future. And it's good news for you today. The power of Jesus over demons is just as available to you today as it was to this dude in Mark chapter 1 who went to the synagogue when Jesus was teaching. Jesus has power available to you over demons. Another power Jesus has in chapter 1 is the power to heal. If you go down to verse 34, it says, he healed many who were sick with various diseases. I appreciate that word various um, because let me just tell you a story. When I was in college, I went bungee jumping with my brother who's two and a half years older than me. And I thought, oh, I'll go bungee jumping with him. That'll probably impress him. It'll think I'm the cool little brother. So anyways, my brother goes first on the bungee jumping platform, you know, and he's just this fearless guy. He gets up on the platform, bungee strapped to him, and he does this like graceful swan dive. 
all the way down to the bottom of the bungee bounces, and it's like up and down. I'm like, cool. And then I'm like on the platform, and they're like raising me up way high, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so scared. I am so scared. I didn't want to jump, so I ended up kind of like flopping off of the platform. <laughs> the whole way down, my back is arched back up to the clouds, thinking maybe I could resist gravity. The bungee bounces, and my back snaps. Ouch. It hurt bad, like worse than push-up number seven. And so I was walking around for a few weeks like a pregnant woman in her third trimester, you know, like, oh, my goodness. And one weekend, a few weeks later, I go on this uh, kind of Christian retreat training thing with some of my Christian friends. They say, Doug, let us pray for your back. And I'm like, nah, guys, not that big of a deal. They're like, no, we've seen you, bro. Let us pray for your back. And uh, I was like, okay, they're my friends. They're Christians. They love me. And so they just gather around me. They put their hand on my back and prayed that Jesus would heal my back. The pain was gone immediately, miraculously. It was gone. I'm like, sweet. Like, Jesus has the power to heal, and I've tasted that personally in my life. I also keep a record, kind of a diary of miraculous healings that we've seen in our church. These aren't healings that I watched on some YouTube video off in the, some corner of Africa. This is like here in City Light Council Bluffs. We've seen a man's heart healed, and the doctors went in to put a stent in his heart, and they're like, oh, what happened? We don't need to do this anymore. Uh, we've seen a child born with only one kidney, but Jesus miraculously grew a second kidney in him. We saw a woman whose arm was healed. She was unable to raise it, and then she gave her life to Jesus, got baptized, and Jesus healed her arm. We've seen a man's esophagus healed, and his surgery was canceled. We've seen a daughter's hearing fully restored and more. So let me ask, are you sick? Are you injured? Can you engage and lean into the power of Jesus Christ? So you're like, let's be a people who lean into the good news of Jesus' power. Let's be a people who engage the good news of Jesus' power. And in fact, as you read the Gospel of Mark, you might want to pray something like this. Jesus, as I read about your power, help me experience your power in my life. So the good news of Jesus' person, the good news of Jesus' power, and the third String of peace. Here we go. The good news of Jesus' purposeful path to the cross. Jesus' purposeful path to the cross. Now, I'm going to read a bunch of Bible verses in a row here. Don't try to follow along in your Bibles. You can just see it on the screen. But notice the repetition. And when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And immediately he called them and they left their father. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath. And immediately he left the synagogue. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. You see the repetition. Now, before we think that like Jesus sped walked everywhere that he went, you know, or those Daniel LaBelle videos where it's like people doing everything in a rush, before we start thinking that way, let me clarify. This word immediately is an English translation of a Greek word. The Gospel of Mark was originally written in Greek. And here it gets translated to immediately, 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 immediately. But it first shows up in verse 3 that Eric read to us earlier, and it reads like this. Make his paths straight. Make his paths straight. So Mark is talking about straight paths, direct paths. And Mark makes it clear here in chapter 1 and throughout his gospel that they are straight, they are direct, they are immediate paths to the cross. In other words, Jesus, when he was fulfilling his mission, he stayed on the straight path, the direct, the immediate path. No wandering around, no getting distracted, no meandering, or as my dad used to tell me, no lollygagging. <laughs> Immediately, repeatedly, he stayed on his purposeful path to the cross. This word actually shows up 43 times in the Gospel of Mark. And each time, it's a reminder that everything in Jesus' life connected to his purposeful path to the cross. In fact, as you read, Mark, every time that you read the word immediately, let me encourage you, immediately pick up a pen and circle the word immediately and draw a cross next to it. 
Let it remind you that each moment in his life, each miracle, each story, each leper cleansed, each storm calmed, each sermon spoken, each man-made tradition broken, it is all connected to the cross, his purposeful path to the cross. And that means something today. It's good news for us because if Jesus' purposeful path was to the cross, and that means the paths of our lives, the various paths, they can have purpose too in light of the cross. For example, husbands and wives, you know this, you have moments in your marriage where the intimacy and union is just so rich in your conversations and your love and your affection for one another. And in those moments, you can go, oh, Jesus, these days, these moments are a gift because you stayed on that path to the cross. This is a sweet grace from you. And husbands and wives, you know there will be days when you are absolutely certain he really is from Mars and she really is from Venus. And you could not be more further apart. And in those days, too, you can go, oh, Jesus, you went to the cross for us while we were still sinners, while we were broken. And so if you did that in our brokenness, we can trust you even when we don't understand each other. Jesus' purposeful path to the cross brings purpose to all kinds of situations in our lives. Parents, whenever you are rejoicing over the wise decisions your children made or you're grieving over their foolish ones, you can go back and say, Jesus, I trust you because you stayed on the path to the cross. Children, whenever you are like feeling alone or isolated, you just want, I don't think anybody understands me. Nobody gets me. And in those moments when you like discover a friend and you complete each other's sandwiches, you know, you can be like, oh, Jesus... I can trust you, whether I'm alone or I'm surrounded by friends, because you stayed on the purposeful path to the cross. Maybe even a little more personal. There will be times, City Light, there have been in the past and there will be in the future, where we press into the power of Jesus. And we pray and we beg him to heal our diseases. And he does. He heals our bodies. He takes away our diseases. The pain is relieved. The doctors are baffled. And we rejoice and we say, Jesus, it's only possible because you stayed on the path to the cross. By your stripes, we are healed. And there will be times when we press into the power of Jesus. And we say, Jesus, would you heal? Jesus, would you heal? And he doesn't. Because he's good, but he's also sovereign. And in those moments, too, we can trust the person of Jesus. Because he stayed on his purposeful path to the cross, he gets tragedy. He gets suffering. He gets loss. And he didn't just go to the cross. He went through the cross into his resurrection. So that even if our suffering takes us to and through death, we know resurrection is on the other side. Mark is so gracious to us when he tells us that every little moment and every big moment in Jesus' life is connected on his path to the cross. Because it tells us that every little moment and every big moment in our lives can also have purpose in light of the cross. And on the cross is where we see the person of Jesus and the power of Jesus most clearly, most fully displayed for us. On the cross is where we can draw near and with Mark in chapter 1 verse 1 we can say, oh, this is the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look and we behold Jesus, as we think on his death on the cross, By the power of your Holy Spirit, would you help us to say, this is the gospel. This is Jesus Christ, real person, real son of God. And I guess it's fast forwarding, but just like the centurion in uh, Mark chapter 15, may we respond and say, surely he was the son of God. So Jesus, in our suffering, those in this room right now who are suffering, sickness, injury, demons, pain, emotional trauma, confusion, broken relationships, betrayal, exhaustion, those who are suffering, may they see you, Jesus, suffering with them. You were on the path to the cross, and you even went to death and through death all the way to resurrection. So may we trust you and hold on to you even when we don't get it, even when we don't fully understand, may we hold on, Jesus, to your person and your power. And Father, I also want to pray 
For those who are rejoicing and saying, I've been healed. The pain is gone. The relationship is restored. God is good and I love the miraculous healing. Oh God, would they look and say, it's by his stripes that we were healed. It's by his stripes that we were relationally reconciled and restored. All glory to Jesus who stayed on the purposeful path to the cross. And so even now, Father, for those who struggle with demons, I pray, would you give them the courage to talk to someone in their city group, to pray with a prayer partner in the back tonight, and not stay isolated, not stay stuck, but would you just give them courage and say, hey, I'm struggling with some stuff. I don't know how to talk about it. I've never told anybody, but would you pray with me? Father, I pray for those who are sick, who are injured. Would you just give them the grace to go, man, Jesus, I want you in the middle of this. I'm not going to wait till I'm better to start talking to you again. I want you in this. I want to ask you for healing. I want to trust you for the grace to persevere. Oh, Jesus, be in this with me. And Jesus, I pray for anybody in this room who's not for sure if they can trust you. Maybe they're just exploring, who is Jesus? What did he teach? What did he think? What did he claim? And they're just wanting to know your person. Would you give them the grace for, to settle for nothing less than you, Jesus? I pray they will not stop at just good attendance at church. They wouldn't stop with just trying to get their life right or be a nicer person, but they would press in. They would demand and crave, Jesus, I want So Jesus, this morning, as best as we know how, as we launch into the Gospel of Mark, we want to respond to you. We want to respond in our hearts today and in our singing and praying. Afterwards, we want to respond in our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, give us the grace to see Jesus and respond to him. We pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. There's power.